I do it. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. We're really excited to be talking with you today about uh, Pat Flynn's book, Superfans. Uh, we, Nathan especially, mm -hmm. has done a lot of legwork in kind of setting this up and getting us organized. Um, and it's a really critical discussion, we feel like, right now yeah. for where a lot of people are in Project 24, where I think there are some um, maybe misunderstandings or maybe wrong ideas about how to approach growing an audience, as well as the importance of becoming an influencer rather than just a commodity. Yeah, and I think there's a, I think that's kind of a big, as you mentioned, it's just kind of a really important thing right now. The way that we're seeing, you know, blogs, you, like you've always mentioned, people used to have favorite bloggers mm -hmm. and now they just don't. And so we just need to kind of shift our mindset, really do a lot of the similar things that we're already talking about, just so that we can get our audience to feel like more connected to us in a way that will kind of keep them coming back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like Pat Flynn talked about. Exactly. I think we've we've just kind of hit on this a little bit already just lately we've been talking a lot about this especially internally about how like bloggers really are just a commodity mm -hmm. for the most part i mean we've we've talked about how transactional a website often is somebody googles something they they find the article they go read the article and they leave and they have no idea who their author was they don't care what the website was they won't ever remember and they may never come back again mm -hmm. and we want to change that mm -hmm. um, and that's hopefully you're able to glean some things from the book yeah um, yeah we had some great discussion kind of in the community over the last i think it was about three weeks we've kind of been reading we set out a reading schedule and so anyway just thanks for the a great discussion we've had some really really good things in there so kind of today just kind of a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about uh, we just want to first kind of give our key takeaways uh, from the book um, I know there were some things in there that really stuck out to me, not necessarily that was new, but it just kind of helped me see how we can take what we already teach in Project 24 and then apply it. So anyway, maybe Ricky, do you want to, maybe you can start, it just, it doesn't have yeah. to be a lot, just whatever you kind of got from the book. You know, there, there was, there was a lot in the book and there were some action steps I felt like from each chapter that um, had some value, some mm -hmm. that I felt like yeah, I could just kind of skip. Um, but um, I think what just stood out to me was how important it is to connect with your audience, um, to make yourself or make you know you seem like uh, somebody that they that they know that they connect uh -huh. with, uh -huh. um, and doing that on a one-to-many level uh, can be really really difficult to do to and maintain authenticity and, and really be genuine about it, but also like feasibly, realistically be able to do it. Right. And so there were some good tips in there for how to do that. Yeah. There's one thing that Pat Flynn does that a lot of people do and that he talked about in the book that drives both of us crazy, um, but it seems to work. So I would like to know, um, go ahead and type in the comments what you guys think about it. And go ahead, is, Income School Nation, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> that is naming your audience. To me, it feels like so condescending to be like, you know, um, my bro is out there or the troopers or the, you know, Pathlin nation. It's like, do you guys want to be, you guys want to be Ricky Kessler nation? I, to me, that would feel like, yeah. So in the book, he talked about yeah. this. He said, you know, to give your audience a name so they feel like it. And, you know, he, uh, you know, he kind of has his, his pet name for the audience. And I, I feel like that's demeaning yeah. and I'm listening mm -hmm. to something. I don't want to be on team Flynn. Yeah. I want Flynn to be on Team Jim. That's right. Um, yeah. I, I want to feel like that influencer is on my team, helping me to succeed. I don't want to be here making that guy a success. Right. Um, it, it's different than when you're like rooting for a sports team. It's just not the same thing. But they, um, they're apparently P24ers. Yeah, P24ers. <laughs> it feels kind of weird to say. It looks good on screen, but. Yeah, that's why, that's why we've never done that is yeah. like, I, I just feel like it's, it's backwards. I need to be yeah, on their like, team. Do you guys agree in the webinar? Like, like do you feel like when you hear we're team David, we're team Carlo guys. I mean, we're, we're here. <laughs> right. I feel like I don't, I don't like it when people name their audience and kind of call you a pet name. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but do you guys feel the same way when yeah. you hear that on YouTube videos? I mean, Maybe it's just me. I don't it's, know. Uh, it might just be kind of a pet peeve for us, but it, it works for a lot of people. They love, People just want to feel like part of a team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like if I were to try to name an audience, I would need to give them a name that is more about like what, what we all have in common, what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. yeah, exactly. So like 
you know, I, I don't know. It, again, I, this isn't about naming you guys and what name you guys want, but like, as you consider doing this, like, how do you make the people that follow you, mm -hmm. like, feel like a part of a team mm -hmm. without like being, yeah, demeaning or condescending. Mm -hmm. Like so. you're calling them like, like your dog, you know? Just not, just kind of weird. So something so that Project was Project 24, yeah, P24 is kind of, fine because they joined the team. I saw income schoolers. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think it's about your internet entrepreneurs. Yeah. And yeah. we're here to help you. You're not there to serve our team. Right. Uh, anyway, I, I think it's an important distinction though because as your channel starts to grow, as your blog starts to grow, as your influence starts to grow, it's really easy to kind of focus inward mm -hmm. on yeah. what that means about you mm -hmm. instead of it meaning about your responsibility to them. Um, and as we, uh, so anyway, we, we want to talk about some, some ways that you can stop being a commodity and you can start to become an influencer who people care about, that you mean a lot more to the person than merely the video you watch right. or the blog post you read. Right. Um, so we talked about um, some channels and blogs that when you see them, even when they're new, you know this is gonna take off. Yeah. You just know it, you watch it and you're like, yep, that's it, that's what people are looking for and it's gonna work. And others you go to and it's just like, mm, this is gonna be a slow burn. This just isn't gonna go. Um, yep. And what is the difference? And so um, we, we watched a few channels before mm -hmm. we began this and we're uh, to try to kind of identify those things like that je ne sais quoi, that thing that when you watch an influencer, you can tell this guy's going to take off or not, um, or gal is going to take off or not. And I think one of the key things is how you feel with that person. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to somebody's house, you know, you're having dinner with another couple or something like it, the things they say, the things they do are only so important. It matters a lot more just how that person feels around mm -hmm. you. If they're having fun and they're goofing off and just feel relaxed, it makes you feel relaxed and like you're having fun with them. Um, your just ability to be not just authentic and not just vulnerable. You can still be vulnerable and authentic in a very straight laced way. Mm -hmm. Uh, but your just ability to just relax and be mm -hmm. yourself, allow your personality to come out, I think is one of the key things. Yeah, and this is like super apparent, super visible on YouTube. Um, it'll be interesting to have the discussion about like, what do we do with the blog? Because really that is a lot more mm -hmm. transactional, mm -hmm. how, you know. But um, on, you know, with, with video or even I think with a podcast, um, it's really easy. And I think a lot of people fall in the trap of, um, putting out information and just like doing it in the format of all every informational video you've ever seen, right? Like, oh, I bought a course or, you know, we all saw informational videos growing up in school, right? They would show a video and it was always some pretty dry, um, you know, straight up presenting the information, but there's no personality behind it. Even mm -hmm. when they like try to throw in like light humor and stuff, there's not like personality behind it mm -hmm. because it's very scripted. Yeah, you um, can throw out a joke and it can land, it can be funny, mm -hmm, but it's right. like a one liner. It just didn't, it just, it, you didn't see the person. And you don't feel any connection to that person. Mm -hmm. And so you don't come back. Um, whereas when you get, a, you see, you watch a video where you feel like, hey, yeah, this guy's cool. Like I would totally go hang out with this person. Mm -hmm. um, that only happens when you come through the video, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're not ever going to appeal to everyone. Mm -hmm. you're n there's never going to be a situation where everyone will like you. Um, trust me. There are a lot of people on YouTube who do not like us <laughs> like on our new channel. I mean, there's people criticizing all the time, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who watch every video when it comes out. And, you know, if we're talking about hunting and shooting and, you know, sports and outdoors. And there are people who will watch every video, no matter how relevant it is to them. And why is that? Because, they kind of feel like we're buddies now. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question I guess is like, how do you do that? How do you yeah. So what are some yourself? steps? If right now you feel like your website is a total commodity at this point, um, how do you begin to work toward this? Uh, to work toward a place where people would buy what you buy. So tonight is the reveal of the Tesla truck, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're gonna do a big live stream and announce it. My, 
my kids and I, my wife, we're making popcorn, getting <laughs> snacks. We have it blocked off on the calendar. Yeah. Everybody sets up their spot on the couch and we're going to watch this thing. We're fans of what they're mm -hmm. doing, right? And it really doesn't matter what they announce. I will buy it. <laughs> it's just, and you can do I'll buy that. your F-150 when yeah. you sell it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do that with a website. We would get all the time, uh, you know, when I would announce a, an info product on, on sites, people would buy it immediately as we barely even announced what it was. And you have to work toward a place like that. So if you're a total commodity now, um, I would first say, like, what if you started embedding some videos about the blog post in the blog post? Mm -hmm. even, right. you don't, even if you don't want to launch a YouTube channel, right. what if you just make a blog post, pull out your cell phone, and you just give a little color to the mm -hmm. blog post and yeah. you'd say, hey, you know, here are a few key takeaways in this. You know, I explained this in the chart, but a couple things you should notice as you did that, as you look through this chart on whatever the topic mm -hmm. is, um, just notice that. And then they've read the article and then suddenly you're like, oh, there's a human being here right. yeah. um, behind this website. And that could be a major trigger, but they may love that blog post and still just go. Right. And so you have to have some kind of hook that you can put into that person, right? You can go in and love this thing, but you're still just gone after you love, after you see that blog right. post that was really helpful. And so what are those hooks that uh, people can do? I, I would say an email list, mm -hmm. a podcast, a YouTube channel. Uh, it could be something like a Facebook group. Uh, you know, if you're in a very niche thing, um, maybe you want right. to push them to a Facebook group where you can communicate with them um, and ha start growing a little community there. It could be a LinkedIn group. There really are a lot of options. Maybe you want to have a forum on your site. I would say, though, if you're doing a forum on your site, you have to have big numbers to launch a forum. It's mm -hmm. harder to get people to want to participate. But um, some kind of hook has to be there. Otherwise, it doesn't really do much good that they had a great one-on-one -on -one connection with you. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because like we've talked about like not doing Facebook, right? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't drive traffic to your site. And that, and I think that's important to note is like, it's not going to drive traffic to your nope. site. Right. If you spend all your time making memes for your Facebook and posting all your articles um, to, and putting it out there in the Facebook group, it's not going to drive a bunch of traffic to your site. What it is going to do though, is give a place for the traffic on your site to go to be a part of a community. Mm -hmm. And once they're part of a community and they feel like, well, part of your tribe, then when you do have something to launch, like you have a group of people who are just ready. Um, and of course, like you want to put out good products, like that's part of it. That's part of maintaining your reputation, but like they're gonna, they're ready. And there's su super fans out there who will buy everything that you make mm -hmm. um, simply because they're part of a tribe, but you don't get super fans through just providing information. I thought it was a cool tip about like making short videos and just embedding them in the blog post if you don't want to launch a YouTube channel. Um, that That's a cool idea. And you can just host those on YouTube, leave them unlisted. And yeah, then like just embed said, them. that's what he's doing. Okay, yeah. yeah, exactly. Then someday when you get on AdThrive, actually I think Mediavine even has this too. Um, they have video ads. You can then go host your videos with them and they'll put their ads in them and rather than YouTube ads, that is like the highest grossing ad there is on yeah. AdThrive Mediavine. I'm pretty sure Mediavine has them. I We've been tried. way behind on this. Man. We keep hearing from people on AdThrive who are saying it's like 20% of their revenue yeah. is having those videos that they upload mm -hmm. to AdThrive and embed in the blog posts. Um, so we really need to get on that. We keep mm -hmm. hearing yeah. really good success so, stories from Anyway, that. if you do want to embed videos, go ahead and host them on YouTube for now. But as soon as you're on AdThrive, move them over to there because that is just a huge Yeah, so like for Camper Report, what we're wanting oh, to do is just create like a couple videos that would just generally apply on the site, like, um, you know, our guide to choosing your first RV. Yeah. Um, and then that could really be embedded in just about all of them. Have a sticky yeah. video player yeah. on the sidebar or something like that. Yep. Um, that could do some pretty cool stuff. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Pretty cool. Okay, something that really stuck out to me when I was first reading the book, it was talking about when you're first starting, um, and that's extremely applicable to many of you in Project 24, those of you who don't come with an existing website. When you're first starting your website, 
that ghost town phase is tough. Yeah. And one thing that Pat Flynn talked about in the book was creating your first super fan and how that can kind of turn into a chain reaction. And we've kind of, as I've been planning the YouTube course and as we've talking about the, uh, the 60 steps has really been kind of on my mind and how that, how like being in forums, you know, being on in a Facebook group, being in all those more public social places that can help you in the early stages of your blogs in the early stages of your YouTube channel. And that helps it's promotion to some extent, but in the same way, they're getting to know you. So mm-hmm. that's something that was kind of interesting to me that could help maybe kickstart, maybe not a lot, but at least get you some traffic a little earlier on. Yeah, so let's talk about that. How do you how do you get your first super fan? Yeah, the first person who is like actually behind you and mm-hmm. wants yeah. to do the everything you do. Um, it's tough early because once you've once you've kind of gained some ground and there's an audience around you, people feel like, oh, this is cool. Other people like this. Mm-hmm. When it's brand new, it's then people see like you have zero support. a long time ago, um, I did a 30 day photography course. And so each day I would email my students uh, one video lesson. Um, And the reason I emailed it out each day is because I didn't have all 30 days of lessons when it started, right? And it was awful. It was so bad. Uh, I was doing my best, but it really was bad. Um, And, you know, the people were pretty nice to me and you know people didn't rip me apart like they probably should have um but uh but it was tough and so years later like five or six years later we were holding a conference for improved photography for my website and hundreds of people came in from all around the world to this conference and uh, a lady stopped me and said hey i was in your very first online course years ago and i was like whoops sorry um and she said you know it was a pretty bad course to be honest and she she even remembered that she could hear my kids like screaming and crying in the room uh, beside me in the back of the video and i didn't even like stop to redo it and stuff um and she she anyway she talked about how you know, she watched the course, it was kind of whatever, and kind of left, didn't do much with the brand uh, in future years. But her husband died years later, and she decided she just wanted to do something for herself again. And she just remembered that course and that she wanted to get back into, into photography. And so she came back and there she was at the conference and stuff. Um, and so, you know, years later, um, she was still involved in the brand. And so what, so, it really can work even with very small numbers really early to create a super fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the things we've already talked about um, is allowing your personality to shine through uh, to be able to do that. Um, we've also talked about having some kind of hook to allow that to happen so that they can even find you again. But there's more required. You have to be producing something unique. Uh, We love and talk about frequently in the office, uh, the purple cow concept, Um, that if you've read the book, it's awesome. Comment if anybody's read the book, the purple cow, it's really cool. Um, Anyway, the idea is that if you want to, if you want to create a fan, you have to be doing something different than what everybody else is doing. Um, So it's something we talk about frequently, like we can sit down and do this video or we could do like a little fun skit or something in it. Uh, we Skittles. could Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We could uh, make some products a paid product, but maybe every once in a while you want to create something, an awesome product and just make it free. Yeah. Um, we, we, there are some things you have to do that just don't make sense in order to serve your audience. Absolutely. So an example of that um, is in in improved photography, we would do um, free photography workshops. So they would usually cost, you know, 3000 bucks to do a photography workshop where you go work in a small group with another photographer um, and they, you know, go to Iceland or whatever and do photography for a week. And I just thought, you know, I'm making money from other things um, on improved photography, the online courses. And so... I would like to travel around to take pictures around the world so I have cool things to share on the website. So 
what if I just bring a group of people with me and teach them for free? And so where it would cost thousands of dollars, I would, you know, several times a year, I'd say, hey, I'm going to China. 20 people can sign up. Doesn't cost you anything. Um, just just you go sign up and yeah. it would sell out like that, right? Sell out. It was free. Um, and the people would come and those people... I mean, the people that were on those groups, they would go on vacations together. Uh, we had some dating relationships that started from those <laughs> groups. Like they really became a part of the tribe mm -hmm. uh, behind improved photography. And some of those people on groups, I'd see their purchase come in five years later that they brought something. And to be able to keep anybody in an internet tribe for five years is just an incredible feat. Um, and so sometimes you have to do things that make no business sense whatsoever. Yeah, and I think you brought up a good point that was that kind of I thought was important that when you went on these trips, things started happening in their lives that they connected mm -hmm. to your brand. Yeah. And I think that that there's another thing you talk about in the book is creating these experiences for your users. And I think that oftentimes when we think about creating an experience, we think about what can we give them from our brand in our information space that will create that experience for them. But I think that even outside of just your space, your information, you can create special experiences that they will just, that's maybe some psychology, I don't know, I'm not really into that, but where they link those experiences like the dating relationship or their friendships or their vacations, they kind of link that back to your brand. And I think that that's kind of a big, probably a big thing. Yeah, yeah and I think, I think the reason that that makes, um, that that works to do some things that just don't make business sense um, is that it, it's unexpected. It is the purple mm -hmm. cow when you see a company do something that you're like, wait, what's in it for you in this, right? Where you expect it to be for sale and it's just not, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, we give Nathan a budget every month since he's our customer success director. Uh, we give him a budget each month to do some things that are just nice for a Project 24 member. Like if if we set it up so that when whenever somebody... Uh, reaches pizza day we always send a pizza to their house it becomes expected mm -hmm. and it's just not that special yeah um if instead uh we just randomly do that and it's totally unexpected somebody just gets a pizza uh or somebody mentions oh i've been out of project 24 because i had an illness or something and nathan sends some flowers or something when it becomes the unexpected thing it's way 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 different and so um, it just because it feels like, wow, I didn't even know you knew I existed, right. you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think really creating super fans is like creating a super friend uh, mm -hmm. in real life. You know, if you're just doing the things that someone who is friendly toward you would do, you're a neighbor, right? Uh, when you do something really unexpectedly kind for somebody, you're a friend. Yeah. So uh, Buck is asking about, you know, putting the little about me in the side like we have on Camper Report with mm -hmm. Jim. Um, does that help to build super fans and does that uh, help with eat? And to me, like that is kind of a baseline. Yeah. Like, it feels what very, it, what it does do is it helps me to know that there's a human behind it, mm -hmm. but, um, but that's it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does give me a face to associate with the content, which is better than nothing. Um, but also, so does having a nice about section at the bottom of the blog post with the actual author. Um, you know, if you have a good image there with some good text, I, that can help just as much. And neither of those is going to create a super fan. I think, you know, that's kind of like base level eat. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for super fans, we need to think just a little bit more outside the box. Like, yeah, what can we do to, yeah, to kind of pull people in and create a different experience for them? And again, that's a little bit harder to do through just written text. Um, I think, again, we need to start thinking a little bit more purple cow. I think for most of your content, your response posts and stuff, like straight up information is fantastic. Um, that's what's going to win the Google rankings. But if you can like tie in some sort of, um, you know, something at the end, maybe there's a little video or you're going to link them to another article that's more of a pillar that also like pulls sucks people into the brand. Um, I think that's going to be a better option than just trying to rely on, you know, a, a little thing like that. Yeah. And when this happens, I think is a really critical question. So you talked about, um, about, you know, getting some numbers and, and I would want to say that if you're just starting your website, you're just starting to write those pillar posts that are informational and stuff. I don't know if I would waste any time at all 
creating a podcast, a YouTube, maybe, maybe yeah. a YouTube channel. Um, I, I wouldn't waste time creating these hooks um, just yet. Having said that, um, we just had a Project 24 member uh, stop by the office mm -hmm. yesterday and we were chatting. He's at 30,000 page views a month. Um, and suddenly we're going to have an, on Tuesday, it'll come mm -hmm. out the yeah. podcast with him. We recorded a podcast kind of going through his site and stuff. And so uh, his website is anybulldog.com. He was okay with us sharing that. Um, he's at 30,000 page views a month and he's doing okay. He's earning a couple hundred bucks a month, but he now stumbled on some great monetization mm -hmm. that he's implementing, which is insurance for pets um, because bulldogs have a lot of health issues. And so he has 30,000 page views a month and has for a few months. Um, and so now that he has a great monetization method, he's saying, holy cow, I really wish I had an email list of the 30,000 people per month that have come here for the last several months that I could have grabbed some of them because I could be sending out an email now saying, Let, you know, look at this pet insurance and it could be a big money earner. Um, but he didn't implement the hook quite at the right time. And so now ah, he's lost a couple months. It's yeah. not that big of a deal. You implement it now and you move forward, right? Yeah. But I guess I feel like maybe it's like the 10,000 page view a month uh, mark right. where I'm like, okay, let's just press pause for two days and put a couple hooks in the website. Go to your top articles and see how we could kind of start hooking people uh, in that content. <laughs> Um, now, if you're on YouTube, this is easier because there's the built-in subscribe, right? But if it's just a blog, you have to kind of think about what that hook is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kiwi Tom brings up a good point about like on a blog, we've told a lot of people turn off comments. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is one, you're dealing with a lot of spam, but two, like it can be a big time suck to try to moderate all those comments. And I don't feel like it is a hook. It, well, Do and you? that's the thing. like. There's certain types of content, especially like opinion content, which again, doesn't do as well in Google search. Um, that, it, it, that does kind of like invite people to interact, mm -hmm. right? But most of the time on more informational topics, like all the comments are people who want to ask a follow-up question, want to tell you you're stupid, or they want to spam you. Mostly want to tell you you're stupid. <laughs> yeah, there's, you get a ton of spam. But then you get a lot of people that are like, well, I disagree with this and you're an idiot. You obviously don't know anything about campers. It's like, I own people have, you know, like, um, and so it, it, if it doesn't create good engagement, then turn it off. If you're in an industry where there is a lot more, like people are wanting to have a discussion, then, you know, maybe it does make sense for you to have comments. But again, in the earliest stages of your website, you have less than 10,000 views a month you're not going to get any serious engagement on any specific blog posts and it's going to take away from content creation, which is far more important, especially in this early stages. And so a lot of this like super fan stuff kind of comes after you have sort of a base level of content, mm -hmm. um, especially in the blogging space. Like, I'm sorry, if you haven't written 30, 40, 50 articles and you only have 2000 people a month coming to your whole website, Turning on comments isn't going to help you one bit. So. Yeah. Now, if you are in one of those places where you think comments do make sense, where it's um, kind of a discussion and you want to hear multiple points of view or something like that, kind of an advice thing, or for example, in recipes, Google recently said that they actually care about how many comments you have with a recipe because they can validate if the recipe worked or not, right? So if you are in one of those, I would definitely get a plugin called, um, subs I think it's called subscribe to comments or subscribe to comments reloaded, something like that. Anyway, uh, so it will send an email to that person if, they, if someone has commented. Now the trouble with this is Bluehost doesn't work well with these plugins because they don't want to be sending email yes, yeah. through from the WordPress. And so it, you may find that it doesn't work on some hosts and it works well on others. Um, and so anyway, just something to be aware of. But if you want to have any hope of those comments doing any good where you can actually have a discussion, you've got to have that because somebody will ask a question they're not coming back to your blog post to see if you answered. If it sends them an email, you at least stand a yeah, chance. Absolutely. And you know, if you get a comment here from like a recipe site, mm -hmm. well, on a recipe site, like comments are the thing it does that, that tells Google sense. which recipes people are engaging with right. more. Mm -hmm. And so again, you can't take any of those, anything, 
any of those specific tips as a, like this applies to everyone across the world because it really does depend a lot on what you're doing. Yes, yeah, somebody, I think it may have scrolled up already. Somebody mentioned they use a Discord server, which is kind of like we use Discourse for Project 24. Yeah. That's Discourse, different than Discord, it is, but... Uh, but it's the same kind of thing. That's a great idea. Um, the, the traditional forum and comments just, ah, but there are a couple new kind of solutions that are just a little bit slicker. Yeah. Well, um, and somebody else were. pointed out the like having a little ask a question thing in the sidebar or something where they submit a question to you that you can address and even give them a little bit of a shout out. Like mm -hmm. um, it, that may be able to get people to engage, but it doesn't just open the floodgates for everybody that wants and to that is right. something that i did for a long time uh on my site when it was brand new is i would at the end of blog posts i would say hey if you have a question about this whatever send me an email and i'd have a contact form right there i wanted to hear from them and i would get ideas of what other questions they had that maybe my search analysis didn't unearth um and so i did find some cool questions there that i i sometimes would just reply back to them directly and sometimes i'd take that question and say hey i I think this could work on Google and I would yeah. send it out. Uh, so doing that, taking advantage of what you can do as a new website that a bigger site cannot do yeah. is a, I mean, great. It's taking advantage of, of the bigger sites because the bigger sites just can't. Can you imagine if we just had an email form on income school? We would literally receive hundreds or thousands of emails a day. We, we already get tons of emails every day mm -hmm. and we don't share we're so emails. careful with that email <laughs> somebody somebody stalked me and called my cell phone yesterday yeah and was like hey i had to look you up and stuff but i found your cell phone number i have a question about my blog i'm like where did you find my phone number this is creepy <laughs> right i've probably had three or four people over the last year who have somehow found my phone number um, and yeah, it is kind of creepy. It's like, I just, you know, hello. They're like, hi, is this Ricky from income school? I'm like, yeah. yes, <laughs> like, no, I am not. <laughs> yeah. I think this is kind of on the long, the same line, same topic. Like what are what is keeping people from doing this? Yeah. And I think that right there, it's probably one of the yeah. biggest things, that, you know, people are just kind of scared of putting themselves out there. So like, I guess we could, rather than talking about why people aren't, what can we do, you know, or what can everyone do to kind of get around those things? We talked about it a little bit in the eat course. Um, yeah. but what are some of your guys' thoughts? Well, and it was interesting because like um, in the book, Pat Flynn actually mm -hmm. talked about like protecting yourself a little bit right. digitally, like don't ever use your home address ever. And there was a little while where like we didn't have another address and mm -hmm. for a little while, Jim's home address and then my home address were tied to the business and um, you know, like, and there was a time in the early days when we didn't use domain privacy because that extra 10 bucks a year I, was more than we wanted to spend. Um, and, you know, there are things like that that it's probably worth it to do it right mm -hmm. from the start. Mm -hmm. If there's, you know, potential, like if you're just going to be a blog and you're never going to work on building super fans, it's not probably ever going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. If you're always going to be like totally passive, I'm going to create content and, um, and just put it out there and Google will send some traffic and nobody will ever know or care who I am. Um, that's one approach and that's fine. But if you're ever going to try to like build a tribe, because that's where the huge opportunity in this business is like, you got to know that for every super fan, there is the potential for a super hater. Mm -hmm. And also for every super fan, there's the potential for a super creepy fan <laughs> and you have to be careful with that. So um, yeah, just basic protection. Yeah. I, and I'm, I don't know. I don't, I don't worry as much yeah. about privacy uh -huh. as I think most people do. Um, but, uh, cause you know, most people are just awesome uh, and it's great. Absolutely. And, and I think that does play into a lot of people's, um, fear, uh, with, with moving out from becoming a commodity to someone that people follow on stuff. I don't think I want to <laughs> contact me on the forum. <laughs> Is uh, we hear from a lot of people who don't want to kind of bridge that gap into becoming something other than a commodity mm -hmm. because of that. And what I would say is don't allow a generalized fear yeah. uh, to stop you from doing something that could be really valuable for you. If there is some kind of legitimate uh, concern you have that is an actual likely scenario, fine. But mm -hmm. uh, don't just say, I don't want my face on the internet because I don't want my face on the internet. 
mm, I don't know if that's valid. That's probably right. just one of your interferes that's being justified in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And to be fair, like my wife has that fear. She's like, I don't really want to be on your stuff. I don't really want our kids on your stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just, I respect that. Um, even though I'm like, it really, it doesn't matter, but okay. And I'll, but I'll respect that because uh -huh. that's how she feels. But on the other hand, you know, if, if, if we didn't put our faces out there, if we only created the income school blog, nobody on this webinar would know who we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear from some of you guys. Um, a lot of you people who are here, um, what, what is your plan? Like you've heard of all the ideas and kind of the point of doing this. What's, what's your plan uh, to take your site from, you know, maybe a commodity of just article, 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 article with information and start moving toward building an audience. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can do it, obviously. And so let's hear kind of what ideas you have and the way you're gonna start to implement this. Uh, definitely hearing a YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So YouTube um, obviously is great because you see the person, there's a built-in way to subscribe. There's some real nice benefits to it, but also, you can easily become a commodity on YouTube too. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting a, a puppy for my son for Christmas and I've been watching a ton of YouTube channels about like what the best breed of puppy is and stuff that I feel no allegiance to whatsoever. Even if the video was really well done, I'm good. I'm, you know, yeah, I, I liked the, the video. I maybe even clicked like, but I didn't really want to click subscribe even mm -hmm. if they told me to click subscribe. And so why? Why do you sometimes reach for that subscribe button? Like pay attention then as you're watching YouTube and say what actually made you click subscribe rather than like, rather than just saying that was a helpful video right. and leaving. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear your guys' ideas. What makes you reach for subscribe? What is that thing? Um, because it's not always obvious. You can make a killer video that's super helpful and you still don't want to do that. Yep. Um, another one too that somebody here posted that they're going to do an email list, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, gathering emails is great. It gives you the opportunity to pitch something later. But earlier on in the webinar, I did see somebody's question like or comment. I don't know what to send. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to send out. I can gather emails, but like, how do I keep these people engaged? Um, yeah. You don't want to just send out like a weekly, oh, here's what was posted in the last week. Nobody wants to read those. You don't want to send something out every day because people's inboxes fill up and they just unsubscribe. So what do you do? And I think like, think about what was the last email list email that you actually opened and why did you open it? So you actually, thing after you video. got on it, you were like, oh, I'm glad I'm on this list. Right. <laughs> That's exactly. the hard one. And that, it's rare, <laughs> but like part of that is like, letting people know what they're going to get when they sign up and not, I mean, every time, anytime that you kind of like trick or gimmick somebody into signing up for an email list, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be reluctant to ever open an email. They mm -hmm. signed up because mm -hmm. they were going to get a freebie, not because they cared about the content you were going to send out. But if you're just, if the reason they signed up was for the content you were going to send out, mm -hmm. then they're going to want to open the email. Yeah. So like, what if you did something that really makes people glad they were on the email list? Like, you know, you have a YouTube channel that's existing and stuff and you have an audience on it. Well, you could do something like send out an email with a cool Excel sheet that you've created for your people, a tool to figure out how much their home renovation cost is going to be something you put some work into that, like maybe you could charge a little bit of money for, mm -hmm. but you just send it out to all your email subscribers. And then in your YouTube video that day, say, Hey, if you were on my email list, you just got a really cool tool that later we're going to charge for, but I just send it to, to everybody for free. That was the only way to get it. It's gone. Yeah. Right. And suddenly everybody that watches your videos like, maybe I better get on that email. Yeah. And I think yeah. the hyping kind of the marketing to that is an important piece mm -hmm. because like that email could just end up in their spam folder, but right. maybe they're watching your YouTube video mm -hmm. and now they go look for yeah, it. And now they're like, Oh, <laughs> I just got, I got something that. special. You know? uh -huh. And I, so I think yeah. that's kind of an important piece, you know, kind of letting the rest of your audience know that they're missing out on something, mm -hmm. you know, there's a little bit more and maybe it wasn't that hard for you to create. Maybe it took an hour, you know, just mm -hmm. an Excel sheet, but, just letting your general audience know that there's some people getting a little bit better of ex an experience. I think that that's a... And you could actually, that would be kind of a cool idea for us is with each YouTube video that we put out, if there was a, you know, an action step PDF yeah. or something, we could kind of fill it out and it comes out same time as the YouTube video. 
uh, each time. And then in every video, you could say, hey, if you got your action PDF, mm -hmm. uh, you can go yeah, ahead and definitely. go with this. You know, we have a chart of all the information and stuff. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, and it certainly takes a little bit more time to put that together mm -hmm. every week. But um, again, like it could really, really, really be worth it mm -hmm. um, for any of you guys out there who are thinking like, how do I, yeah, how do I engage more with people? How do I get people to actually open the emails I send them? That would, that's a really great idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kimberly says, I only subscribe to a few channels. Y'all knocked off Studio C. No way. <laughs> we'll have to let Jason know. Yeah, <laughs> we went to high school with Jason. Jason Gray <laughs> from the original cast. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining us uh, in this webinar. We just wanted to get the juices flowing, the creative juices mm -hmm. of how exactly you can start to implement this. When you start to create super fans and super fans, it's not about, you know, ah, don't feel like you have to be a teeny bopper vlogger that has right. fans. I don't know if that's the right word. I'm I certainly not a teeny is bopper man. vlogger. Right. I don't, I don't know if that's the right word, but just people who are on, whose team you can be on. Maybe yes. I'll say it that way. Yeah. People who say, man, I want that guy on my team. I want that girl to teach me every Wednesday how to be a better interior designer. I want that lady to teach me how to be a better business leader. I want that guy to teach me how to fix my car, whatever it is uh, that you're into, like find some people who want you on their team uh, and will even go to the point of being willing to pay to have you on their team. When you can do that, suddenly monetization is I mean, not 10 times easier, but 100 times easier yeah. when you can bridge that gap. When somebody says, that guy's on my team and I want to take, want to take them with me into battle yeah. or whatever. I don't know if battle's a little bit. Phil Haas <laughs> says, what's in the water in Idaho? <laughs> I don't know. Just water. That's the difference. <laughs> PBC, this new office, the water tastes terrible. It's a brand new building, uh, apparently so. Well, thanks everybody for being here. We really appreciate uh, all of uh, Income School Nation. Just kidding, that was a joke. Um, I appreciate everything you guys do. Uh, we are rooting for you. We talk all the time about like Project 24 is the thing that like, hey, you've already subscribed, you've already paid. There will be no upsell ever in Project 24. Like they have put us on their team now. Mm -hmm. And so we are like, okay, what tool do they need? What could we reinvest in that makes Amy and Buck and Miguel and Fran more likely to succeed with their site? And so thank you for trusting us with that. And uh, if there's anything we can do to do that better for you, you let us know. Do I want to end this session? Yes.